body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And today we are covering the very dark case of the teenage vampire killer, Rod Farrell. Taking me back to that series, Teen Wolf, as a kid. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Forgot about that one. I've I've been waiting to cover vampires on this show, and me and my girlfriend are big fans of Twilight, and they're just so fascinating, like all the capabilities they have. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people believe that vampires are a real thing. I mean, that it's not just this urban legend or stories you know, passed down for thousands of years. I mean, the stories of vampires go back to pretty much the beginning of time. Yeah. And that's kind of one of the main reasons people who sort of adopt this lifestyle of being a vampire believe in it so much is because it has been around for so long and they believe that, you know, through the drinking of blood and other people's blood that you're able to gain more power and abilities. Yeah. And, and live forever, right? Yeah. Yeah. And essentially be immortal. I believe most most kind of mm-hmm. follow that line of thinking. But this is a story of vampire lifestyle gone very, very wrong and gone down a dark path. Because I mean, vampires, one of their core beliefs is that you don't kill anybody. And in this particular case, that it, the quite the opposite happens here. Because in the 1990s, when a group of outcasts didn't fit into the mundane religious lifestyles of the Bible Belt, they rebelled against the grain. Some more than others, but Rod Farrell found his place among a group of teenage vampires, and he took his vampiric oath to the extreme as he ventured down his dark path of blood, lust, and violence he would soon become the youngest man on death row. It's not every day that you hear about a vampire killer. No. This is one of those cases that is definitely more obscure, but a rather dark one, Mm -hmm. I have to say. And Rod is still there on death row, waiting to be executed for the crimes that he committed. But before we dive into the very wildlife of Rod Farrell and his crimes. I want to remind everybody that one way you can support the show for free is by following us on Spotify. Spotify is the premier place to enjoy Lights Out, and I encourage every one of you to just take a second, go over to Spotify, type in Lights Out, and hit that follow button for us. And now on Spotify, you can actually watch the video version of the show, which is really cool. Joel puts hours into creating the visual aspects yeah. and overlays for the podcast. I feel it's very important to make the story more immersive. Exactly. That's what we're all about here is immersive experiences, taking these stories and cases and really putting you right in the middle of them to the best of our ability. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, also subscribing to us on YouTube is always helpful as well. Um, Apple Podcasts works too, but ultimately Spotify is where it's at. And we always appreciate if you leave us a star or just a review in general. There's the reviews and ratings on Spotify now. Yeah, we love that feedback. So, Because Lights Out is continuing its reign in the top podcast in the entire United States. (laughs) Just makes me smile, man. It's It's crazy. It's a dream. It's crazy. It is a dream. It's a total dream. We're super thankful for the opportunity to be able to do this and bring these stories to you every single week. So join us in following and subscribing on all the platforms you find Lights Out. This episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Rothy's, Stamps.com, Babbel, and Purple. Also, if you're looking for CBD products, my company, Higher Love Wellness, we got the best stuff in the game for humans and pets. Check it out at higherlovewellness.com. You can use code Lights Out and get 10% off your order. But let's go ahead and dive right into the story of Rod Farrell, the teenage vampire killer. So Roderick Justin Farrell was born on March 28th, 1980 in Murray, Kentucky. His mother, Sandra Gibson, raised him, but he barely knew his father, Rick. His mother and father had actually met in high school and dated for a year and a half before becoming pregnant with Rod. They quickly got married, but things didn't work out after a year of marriage, so they got a divorce. Sandra was only 16 years old at the time when Rick left, and she was still pregnant with Rod when he joined the military. As Sandra raised her son by herself, she struggled with mental illness and occasionally worked as a prostitute in order to make ends meet. 
She would also impulsively date and marry random men. So much of Rod's childhood was very unstable, and his family moved around quite a bit. He once wrote in a school essay that his mother was a monster when she was angry, but despite this, he still loved her. To add to his complicated childhood, he claimed he was molested by his grandfather at a young age. He also claimed that he saw human sacrifice during a vampire ceremony when he was just five years old. By the time Rod was 12 years old, he directed his trauma towards an obsession with the darker side of life. He noticed his mother had an interest in vampires and her hobbies influenced his early years. Sandra first introduced him to a role-playing game called Vampire the Masquerade. It's a game set in a gothic punk version of a modern world. The goal is to role-play as a vampire and deal with typical vampire struggles night after night. And ever since he first played the game, Rod became absolutely obsessed with vampires. Over time, he slowly convinced himself that he was actually a 500-year-old vampire named Visago, the same character he played in his role-playing game. So the game turned into reality for him. And in vampiric lore, Visago was a ninth prince of hell who could see into the future. And he took on this persona the older he got. Growing up, Rod had a little guidance from his parents, and his home life was often a mess. So he escaped into his vampire fantasies. He played vampire games, read vampire books, and watched vampire movies whenever he could. And since he had limited outlets in Murray, Kentucky, he began collecting various weapons and terrorizing neighborhood cats in his free time. And it wasn't long until he turned his violence towards himself. One night, his mother walked into his room and saw Rod had taken a razor blade and cut himself from his lower stomach all the way to his throat. He was fascinated by how the blood looked when it seeped from his skin and ran down his body. This obviously horrified his mother, and she didn't know what to do. Soon after, she began finding hard drugs in Rod's bedroom, and she realized she was in way over her head. His bedroom became filled with the Necronomicon, upside-down crosses, shards of glass, metal hooks, and other weapons laying around. Sandra knew she was failing as a mother, and she claimed she tried to get help for Rod, but Rod wouldn't take it. So when he was in his teens, and his mother couldn't take care of him, Rod went to live with his friend Jaden and his family for several months. They had first met each other in September of 1995 at high school in Murray, Kentucky, and at first they saw each other as enemies. Rod dressed in trench coats and combat boots, and Jaden wore a dark cloak with combat boots. And since they were so similar in their appearance, the other kids saw it as a competition. Gossip spread around the school, saying that Rod and Jaden wanted to fight each other, and they thought that Rod was stepping into Jaden's territory. Jaden was already the leader of a tight-knit group of teenage vampires. They were social outcasts that met up on the weekends in order to act out dark fantasies, like blood hunts. Rod initially saw them as freaks, but in a good way, because they were like him. They wore long hair, makeup, trench coats, and it made them different, and Rod was drawn to that. He expressed himself in the same way. So Jaden and Rod soon became friends, and they saw a lot of similarities in each other, especially in the darker side of the soul, as Jaden would say. And he became the first to introduce Rod into the vampiric way of life. But early on, Jaden saw Rod letting his darker side take control of him. Rod had heard about the underbelly of vampirism before, but it had been just myths, legends, and role-playing games. And it wasn't until Jaden showed him the way when Rod became obsessed with the occult lifestyle. In January 1996, Rod officially became a member of Jaden's small vampire cult through a process called Crossing Over. Their ceremony was simple but powerful, and Jaden took Rod to the Old Salem Cemetery. He led Rod to a single tree in the middle of the graveyard. It looked like any other tree, but this one was special. It was a ceremonial tree for the cult members. It was where all the previous cult members had crossed over and become new vampires. At that point, Jaden pulled out a razor blade from his pocket as they both stood underneath the tree. He handed the blade to Rod, who pressed it into his left shoulder. He cut himself open three times as the blood flowed down his arm. Jaden then took Rod's shoulder, put it to his mouth, 
and drank his blood until the wound stopped bleeding. When he finished, Jaden took the same blade and cut himself open, and then Rod took his turn, drinking Jaden's blood from his cuts. After they exchanged blood under the tree, Jaden explained that exchanging blood was the highest form of commitment, and there was no turning back. They had just formed a bond through blood. Rod was now a part of something bigger than himself, and after the ceremony, they ended up sitting in meditation for the next few hours before heading home. Rod was now an official member of the cult, and he had to follow a set of simple rules. First, he had to pledge total loyalty and obedience to his new vampiric family. And second, he had to put the family's needs above everything else. As more members joined Jaden's cult of vampires, it wasn't long before their cult became the center for gossip. Everyone else at school heard rumors about the blood drinking, the drug taking, and sexual rituals. And soon, Rod and Jaden would become infamous in the small town of Murray, Kentucky. As they walked down the streets, the religious neighbors would scoff and shake their heads at the boys who dressed in all black and wore upside down crosses around their necks. So you may be wondering, where is Murray, Kentucky? Well, Murray, Kentucky is in the Bible Belt of America. And this particular town is known to be located in the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible Belt, it's the area of the southern and midwestern United States where the Protestant religions are extremely popular. Protestant religions include the Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Nazarene, and religion is so popular in Murray that there is one church for every 300 people who live there. And since Murray, Kentucky is heavily influenced by religion, it's an alcohol-free town. It's also home to the National Scouting Museum, where many people go to retire and settle down. But the town isn't known for its moral decency or wholesome activities. It's now known for Rod Farrell and the cult of vampires who live there. They were social outcasts who wanted to break the usual way of life in Murray. Many of the members that joined the cult were from similar backgrounds. Many came from poor rural families who didn't have many outlets for their differences. So they found each other and they began practicing their vampire rituals in their parents' basements or abandoned buildings out in the woods. While the rest of the town held on tightly to their Protestant religions, they saw these vampire teenagers as godless degenerates. But the vampires took that as a compliment. They followed their own set of rules different from what the Christian church taught. According to the cult members, vampire law forbids murder. The cult acknowledges that human life is sacred, but they also believe that drinking human blood is the only way to achieve immortality. Cult members have described drinking blood as orgasmic. They get a thrill from drinking someone else's energy and feeling it flow through them. They compare the feeling to getting drunk or getting high. And when skeptics tell them it's only a psychological feeling, the cultists disagree. They believe there is a physical transformation in the body when they drink blood. Along with the ritual of drinking blood, the members also have sires, which are their elders in the group. They also obtain different family names when they join vampirism. Scott, Stephen, Vanessa, and another Stephen took on the names Gabriel, Jaden, Angelique, and Raven. Many of them were related by blood or sexually intimate together. Rod had spent countless nights performing deviant sexual acts with the other girls. And because of their sexual progressiveness and drinking blood, they saw themselves as a superior race on this planet, saying that they were a higher form of evolution than everybody else. They also believed their abilities went above and beyond what regular people were capable of. They claimed they had supernatural powers or could even read people's minds. Rod and Jaden both loved the lifestyle but they began seeing things much differently. Just as they had become great friends, Rod showed Jaden his true colors. One day they walked through the trailer park where Rod stopped a tiny kitten at the edge of the neighborhood. He went over to it and picked it up by the scruff. He petted a few times before it became scared and clawed him across the arm. Rod then slammed the kitten down to the ground and pressed it into the dirt. It let out cries for help, but Rod didn't let it go. He looked around him and spotted a tree trunk a few feet away from him. And Rod asked Jaden, you see that tree? 
And that's when he picked up the kitten by the neck and whipped it right at the tree. Its spinal cord snapped against the trunk and it died almost instantly. As Jaden stood in horror and watched Rod mercilessly kill the cat and laugh about it, he knew this was the beginning of the end of their relationship. Jaden had enjoyed the darker side of life as much as any of his other friends, but Rod had now taken it too far. Jaden wasn't interested in hurting helpless animals, but for Rod, he hadn't taken it far enough. He was sick and tired of Jaden's moral standards, and he wanted to become pure evil incarnate. Only a few months after that kitten incident, a local tragedy struck at a nearby animal sanctuary, and the local sheriff thought Rod was involved. On the night of October 13, 1996, a group of people had cut open the chain link fence that led into the sanctuary. The dogs barked at the intruders, but no one else heard the commotion. The intruders went by each cage and unlocked the doors. The bigger dogs were let free, but the puppies had been captured and taken into the field next to the sanctuary. And what happened next would shock and sicken the entire town of Murray, Kentucky. The intruders began cutting off the limbs of the small puppies. Other times they slit their throats or disemboweled them. And as the blood poured, they held up the dying puppies over each other and let the blood drain all over them. They then bathed in the blood and they drank it too. And once the ceremony was over, they took the remaining puppies and smashed them into the ground until they were dead. And by the following day, one of the animal sanctuary workers arrived at the scene and noticed that all the older dogs were roaming around the driveway. It wasn't until she looked around the sanctuary that she found the dead puppies scattered just outside of the broken fence. The remains were drained of blood and thrown across the field. Some had their heads, legs, or intestines missing. At first, it looked like a wild pack of wolves had broken into the sanctuary, but the footprints and the cut open chain link fence told a different story. The local sheriff never figured out who broke into the shelter, but many suspected that it was Rod and a few of his vampire friends who did it while they were out on a blood hunt. And as the violence against animals continued, Rod and Jaden's friendship began to collapse. One night, Jaden and a friend named Bones arrived at Rod's mom's house. They got out of the car and walked up to the front porch. Rod saw them approaching, so he went outside to confront them while his mom watched from the screen door. Tension had already been growing between Jaden and Rod, and that night it would finally climb to violence. During their brief conversation, they both threatened to kill each other, and Jaden ended up grabbing Rod by the throat and pinning him up against his house. As Jaden gripped him tighter around the throat, Rod's face began turning blue. Realizing he might kill him, Jaden let him go, and Rod's mother screamed from the doorway. She told Jaden that he had an obsession with controlling Rod, but Jaden looked up at Sandra and told her that no one could control her son, not even her. Rod pushed Jaden away and threatened to kill him if they didn't leave the property. So they did. But after this, their friendship would never recover. After this incident, Jaden's vampire family banished Rod from the group. And Rod, well, he began taking as many drugs as he could, including marijuana, LSD, occasionally PCP, meth, and heroin. And now that he had lost his old social crew, he had to make new friends and start a new vampire clan. He had met a boy named Michael Schaefer in the old vampire clan. Rod had helped him cross over and join the cult. So he reconnected with Michael and the two of them started a new group. Rod had a way with words and many thought he had a good sense of humor. So many outcasts were drawn to him and in time new recruits joined their clan. Charity Casey, Rod's girlfriend at the time, was 16 years old. Dana Cooper was 19 and Scott Anderson was 16. They had all come from dysfunctional families and they had found a sense of belonging in Rod's cult. Each saw Rod as their new vampiric leader and they pledged total loyalty to him. Like the other, Scott came from a rough household. His father was an alcoholic and his family was extremely poor. He lived in a small shack where they used black trash bags as curtains, and he worked at the local McDonald's at minimum wage. After he met Rod, they became close friends, and Scott quickly became Rod's right-hand man. Rod told Scott to dream big and let his imagination take him outside of the life he was currently living. After Scott met Rod, he finally felt like he had a purpose in life. When they all hung out together, they would fantasize about killing people, but most of them just did it for fun. 
They weren't actually serious about murdering anyone, but for Rod, that fantasy slowly drifted into reality. Unknown to the rest of the crew, Rod had been in contact with an old girlfriend named Heather Wendorf. She had lived in Eustis, Florida with her sister and her parents, but as time went on, Heather's relationship with her family deteriorated, and as he kept listening to the terrible things she said about her family, Rod felt like he had to do something about it. You know, it's funny. There are all these gimmicks that promise a great night's sleep. I don't care what kind of toppers there are or how heavy a blanket may be, it's lipstick on a pig. If you're sleeping on a terrible mattress, your sleep will be terrible. It's that simple. That's why I recommend sleeping on a purple mattress. That's because only purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid. The Gel Flex Grid is amazingly supportive for your back and legs while cushioning your shoulders, neck, and hips, no matter how you sleep. Unlike memory foam, which remembers everything, thanks to the Gel Flex Grid, purple mattresses bounce back as you move and shift, and you'll never have that I'm stuck feeling people get with memory foam. I got the purple hybrid mattress, and I gotta say, I absolutely love it. The responsive support coils and cushioning transition foam allows for a greater airflow and provides a more dynamic response than all foam beds. It also increases the durability of the mattress. My absolute favorite thing about purple mattresses though is the fact that air flows through it unlike other all foam beds where it just is so hot by morning, you're sweating, your bed's covered in wet, moist sweat, and it stinks, but with purple mattresses, you wake up feeling refreshed after a great night's sleep, and there's not an ounce of sweat anywhere. Getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. Get a purple mattress. Go to purple.com slash lightsout10 and use code lightsout10. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. They've got pillows too, folks. That's purple.com slash lightsout10 and use code lightsout10 for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Purple.com slash lightsout10. Use promo code lightsout10. Terms apply. For most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point in our academic careers. I know that was the fact for me. I kind of dreaded going to Spanish class, mostly because I felt like I didn't really learn anything and all the assignments were super boring. It was a lot of writing instead of speaking. And what's the point of that for most of us? Most of us just want to be able to speak the language and understand it. But now thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively fun and easy way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or you just have some free time to kill. Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. I've been using Babbel to start learning Spanish again, and I gotta say, with Babbel's 15-minute lessons, it makes it the perfect way to learn a new language, both on the go, as well as in that 15 minutes I spend in the bathroom in the morning. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective, and with Babbel, if Spanish isn't it for you, you can choose 14 other languages out there, including French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com with code LIGHTSOUT. Babbel is language for life. Heather Wendorf's family was completely different than her, and they struggled to get along. Her sister Jennifer was a regular teenage girl in Eustis, Florida. She was a cheer team member, and she had recently gotten a new car that she loved. She was intelligent and pretty, and she had a scholarship to go to Florida State University. Her parents, Naomi and Richard, were typical suburban parents. They were known by their neighbors and friends as a nice family. Richard worked as a warehouse manager for a bottling company. And Naomi, who preferred to go by Ruth, was a stay-at-home mom, and she often volunteered at her daughter's school. From the outside, the Wendorfs looked like any other family in the neighborhood. But their daughter, Heather, was always known to be a bit different. She was more of what you would call a free spirit compared to her sister, and she developed a rebellious personality in her teenage years. She wore grungy, loose-fitting clothing and often dyed her hair black. She also expressed herself through artwork that often depicted dark creatures and disturbing images. Her teachers remembered her wearing a hangman's noose from her backpack at school, and from the noose, a Barbie doll hung by the neck. She liked to stroll around school showing off her trophy of death, and at home she often got into fights with her parents, to the point where Ruth and Richard didn't know what to do with her. 
They had watched their daughter turn into an angry, depressed girl that was out of control. They had no idea why, but they suspected that the people she hung around were a bad influence. Heather first met Rod Farrell when they were sophomores at Eustis High School. Rod had moved to Eustis for a short time because his mother had found a new boyfriend and married him. So Rod always had to move with her since he was a minor. In Eustis, Rod and Heather quickly became best friends, and they had often spend their late nights out at local cemeteries. They would also sneak into mausoleums and end up staying there way past their curfew. When they were at school, Rod would always wear a black trench coat, even in hot summer days when temperatures would get above 100 degrees. And Heather liked this about Rod. He was different. And he acted like he didn't give a shit. Around the neighborhood, he would show off his martial arts skills and sometimes he would bring out his weapons. When Heather's sister Jennifer confronted him and asked him why he liked his sword so much, he responded, you don't see many cats around here, do you? Which Jennifer was disgusted by the answer. But Heather loved how dark and edgy Rod was when they were teens. They became close and started dating soon after. But Rod eventually moved back to Murray, Kentucky with his mother because her last relationship had fallen apart. From then on, Heather kept in contact with Rod over the phone. They spent hours on the phone together talking about each other's lives, and they stayed in touch as often as they could. They eventually ran up $850 phone bills, and Heather's parents threw a fit. So from then on, they rarely talked on the phone. Instead, they wrote letters to each other. As she told Rod about her terrible life at home, he kept fantasizing about going back to Eustace and killing her parents. This was the wicked thrill he had been looking for. Heather kept mentioning how abusive her parents were, and Rod saw her as a damsel in distress. He fantasized about being the knight in shining armor, coming to rescue his lady, And the more she told him terrible things about her parents, the more he convinced himself that they needed to die. No one knows for sure what was going on in the Wendorf household, but according to Rod's friend Scott Anderson, he believed that Heather was being sexually abused by her father, and her mother knew about it, but did nothing. So not only did Rod have an outlet to murder someone, he now had a good excuse for it. At the time, Rod and his crew didn't have anything else going on in their lives, It was a town that didn't want them there, so he convinced them all to pack their things and come with him to Eustace. Plus, the local sheriff was constantly suspicious of them after the tragedy at the animal sanctuary, so this was their opportunity to get out there and get a fresh start. So they packed up Scott's car and all drove down to Florida with the whole crew of vampires. Michael didn't join them because his mother sent him to a treatment center for children with behavioral problems days before they left. But Rod, Scott, Charity, and Dana hopped in the car and drove southeast. When they arrived in Florida, Rod called up Heather and asked if she wanted to join them. She gave him her parents' address and told him to meet her there. On the evening of November 25th, 1996, Heather met Rod and his friends outside of her parents' house in Eustace. And from there, they drove to a local cemetery, and Heather and Rod wandered off for an hour and a half. Scott figured they were devising a plan, but no one knew what they had actually talked about. According to Rod, he and Heather took a blood oath together. They cut their arms with razor blades, filled a cup with their blood, and drank from it. Before Rod would do anything that night, he wanted to make sure that he and Heather formed a spiritual bond through the blood oath. After they came back, Rod and Heather were oddly quiet. The crew drove back to her parents' house where they planned on breaking in. Scott's car had been breaking down on the way to Florida, So Heather mentioned that her parents had a Ford Explorer they could steal. The keys were in her parents' bedroom, so they would have to break into the house. Rod told her to leave the garage door unlocked so he and Scott could quickly get inside. And Scott had no idea about the thoughts that ran through Rod's head. Rod was solely focused on Heather's parents, and it seemed like a deep rage grew inside of him. Despite the serious situation, Rod decided to drop a 10 strip of golden dragonfly acid before Scott and him snuck towards the house. The girls Heather, Charity, and Dana waited outside in the car. Meanwhile, Heather's parents Richard and Ruth enjoyed their evening like any other, and they didn't have a clue what their daughter and her friends had been planning. Rod and Scott peered through the windows of the house to see where her parents were. Richard was seen relaxing on the couch, and Ruth was in the bathroom taking a shower. 
Rod and Scott circled around the house and broke into the connected garage in order to find a weapon. They also noticed the blue Ford Explorer parked inside, and they both agreed that they should take it if they could find the keys in the house. Rod found an axe and a chainsaw in the garage, but he didn't want to use them because the axe was too bulky and the chainsaw was too loud. But in the corner of the garage, he eventually found a crowbar and he picked it up and held it for a while. The acid was slowly kicking in and he felt the crowbar's weight and gave it a few practice swings. He figured it would make a perfect weapon to bludgeon someone to death with. In the garage, they both agreed that Rod would go in after the father and Scott would go after the mother. They continued through the garage, passing a small washroom until they entered the house. The door was unlocked, so they decided to just walk right in. The TV in the living room blared at full volume, and Richard hadn't noticed the noise Rod and Scott made as they entered. Scott searched around the house looking for the bedroom where the car keys were, but Rod had other plans. He slowly snuck into the living room and got behind Richard. He crouched behind the couch and waited a moment. Scott froze in the hallway looking at Rod. He watched as something shifted inside of him. It was like something had taken control of Rod and there was nothing that he could do. Rod looked down at the man on the couch. His eyes widened and he gripped the crowbar tightly in his hands. The acid had fully kicked in. Richard's head looked ripe and helpless beneath him. It was a perfect spot to drive the crowbar into. But Rod hesitated for only a moment and Richard sensed someone was in the room with him. As Rod drove the crowbar down into Richard's head, blood spattered across the couch, curtains, and lampshade. A surge of blood also shot back towards Rod and covered his clothes. Scott just stood there, frozen in shock, as Rod clobbered the man to death. This robbery had just turned into a homicide, and as Scott watched his friend murder the man in cold blood, he knew he didn't have it in him to kill the mother. He had never seen someone die before, and he couldn't handle it. After Rod made sure that Richard had stopped breathing, he pushed past Scott. He began searching the house for the keys to the Ford Explorer. But as he walked into the kitchen, Ruth caught him. She had a cup of hot coffee in her hands, and she immediately tossed it at Rod's chest, burning him. She then lunged towards him and clawed at his face with her fingernails, and she grabbed Rob's wrist with her other hand. But Rod fought back as hard as he could. As they wrestled in the kitchen, he took the long end of the crowbar and spiked it down into the top of her skull. A loud crack came from her head, and she fell down towards the floor. Rod kept bashing away spiking her in the back of the skull until she laid completely flat on the ground. He kept pounding away at her head with the crowbar until she stopped moving, and by the end of his rage, a giant hole had caved into the back of her head. Rod's clothes were soaked in blood and hot coffee, and red smears of blood covered the entire kitchen. After he made sure she was dead, he went into the bedroom, snagged a pearl necklace and an antique hunting knife, and the keys to the explorer before heading back outside. Scott followed him blindly while still in shock, the girls watched as Rod came out of the garage door soaked in blood. An awkward smile crossed his face. Veins bulged from his head and his neck. With no hesitation, they got into the Explorer with him and drove around the corner. After a few blocks, they got out of the car and swapped the tags with Scott's car, and within minutes they were heading down the road. Rod left two innocent victims in his wake, and a shameless smile crossed his face as his darkest fantasies had finally become a reality. He laughed and screamed in the car while the adrenaline and LSD rushed through his bloodstream, and the rest of them stared in horror. Jennifer Wendorf drove home around 10 p.m. that same night. She was way past her curfew, so she had to sneak into the house and get past her parents in order to avoid getting into trouble. As she quietly cracked open the front door, she entered her dark living room, and that's where she saw her dad lying on the couch. The TV was on at high volume, and it looked like he had fallen asleep while watching. As she snuck past the living room and walked in the kitchen, she froze in absolute horror. The floor and the cabinets splattered with blood. And as she looked across the tile, following the trail of blood, her mother's body was sprawled on the floor laying on her stomach. Blood had begun to pool underneath her body and the back of her skull was completely caved in. As she ran back into the living room and looked at her father lying on the couch, she realized that he was also dead. But she refused to go check on either of them. The thought of having to approach her dead parents was too much for her to handle, so instead she ran into the telephone and called 911. The first deputy on the scene was Jeff Taylor. 
and after inspecting the bodies, the first suspicious thing he noticed was that Jennifer's sister, Heather, was missing, and her parents' car was gone. As they searched the scene, they saw that the mother's head was bashed in so hard that fragments of her skull were found in the next room over. When they questioned Jennifer and asked who could have done something like this to them, her first thought was her sister and her friends. So Heather quickly became a prime suspect. Shoe shopping can be quite the chore these days, and sometimes you don't know exactly what your shoes are made of, or where they came from, or how comfortable they're going to be. Well, Rothy's takes the guesswork out of shoe shopping with comfort right out of the box in super easy and free returns and exchanges. From the unbeatable comfort to the fact that you can wash them, which is my favorite thing. I mean, I love going out in the yard, occasionally I step on dog poop, and when the sink doesn't cut it, you can actually throw these puppies in the washing machine and dryer and have them clean when they come out. People Magazine actually named Rothy's The Point the best flat shoe for their first ever Style Awards 2021. The Point and the Flat from Rothy's may be the usual suspects that you've heard of, but they also make insanely comfortable sneakers, loafers, ankle boots, and more. I got myself a pair of the Merino Chelsea boots, and honestly, when I got them, I was pretty surprised for boots being made out of water bottles. They are super durable and super comfortable, I love the fit of the actual boot itself, and I loved how light they felt on my feet. I also can't get over the fact that you can wash them. That's super, super nice. And the durability of it, I can tell that it would take a huge beating in order to rip these guys apart. But they are going to last you a very, very long time. So solve the case of your next favorite spring shoe with Rothy's. Plus get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash lights out. That's $20 off at R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash lights out and our last sponsor for today is stamps.com a company i've worked with for a very long time and one that i use personally in all of my businesses time is money so don't waste either with repeated trips to the post office i haven't had to go to the post office in probably like five years now since i've been using stamps.com it allows me to focus on all the other millions of things that i have to take care of for my businesses as well as all of my shows stamps.com lets you print official postage right from the computer and saves you money in the process so you can spend less time at the post office or no time there and more time making your customers happy. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over a million businesses, including Higher Love Wellness. We use Stamps.com for all of our postage to get our packages to our customers. Stamps.com gives us all the access of the post office and UPS shipping services we need right from our warehouse computer, which is really nice. We don't have to get any special equipment. We have a scale, we have a regular printer, and we're able to just print postage like there's no tomorrow, and I get discounts up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS rates, which is absolutely amazing. Save me thousands and thousands of dollars. So stop overpaying for shipping with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage and a digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage and enter code lights out. Police soon found an abandoned car in Seminole County, Florida. It had Richard Wendorf's tags from the Ford Explorer on it, but they were obviously on a different vehicle. The VIN number of the car they found was registered to Rod's friend, Scott Anderson. So now they knew they were looking for an Explorer that had Scott's tags on it, and they also had the name of a suspect. The police didn't know where the group of teens were headed, but Rod's plan was to take everyone to New Orleans. He called it the City of Vampires and believed they could start fresh without judgment. But the car ride to freedom wasn't at all what they had expected. The rest of them sat in horror and confusion as Rod screamed and laughed while he was still covered in blood, and Heather cried with heavy, grating sobs knowing that her parents were dead. But Scott didn't know if she was serious or just putting on a show. And as they kept driving towards New Orleans, they made several stops along the way. Rod had changed his clothes in a gas station and threw away the clothes covered in blood. They filled up on gas and food and started their long road trip to New Orleans. After a few days of traveling, Rod became more and more paranoid that the police were close to catching them. They had been pulled over five different times on their road trip, but Rod was able to talk his way out of the situation each and every time. The police had no idea they were talking to the murderer that had caused a nationwide manhunt. But after every encounter with the police, Rod became more anxious. So he decided to take a detour to Baton Rouge. While they were in Louisiana, Rod took a brief stop went down to a nearby waterfront and tossed a bloody crowbar into the Mississippi River. From there, they got back into the car, but they were running low on money, food, and gas. 
Charity, Rod's girlfriend, mentioned that her mom might have some money they could borrow. So after thinking it over, Rod allowed her to call home. When she made the call from a local payphone, her grandmother picked up. She was worried about Charity and asked where she was. And as she begged her grandmother for money, her grandmother agreed and told her to meet them at Howard Johnson Motel in Baton Rouge. Her family would meet her there and give her some cash. After she hung up and told the crew, they were relieved that they finally had a supply of money coming their way. But they didn't realize that they were walking into a trap. Charity's grandmother had been in contact with the police. And on November 28, 1996, they set up a sting operation at the Howard Johnson Motel. As the crew pulled up into the motel parking lot, the police were already waiting for them. As soon as Scott cut the engine to the car, several squad cars with flashing lights surrounded them. At that point, they were arrested, and they were taken back to the police station and put into holding cells. But Rod and Charity didn't seem worried about their current situation. They actually caught on holding cell cameras passionately making out with each other, and soon after the teens were extradited to Florida where the real interrogations began. Heather quickly claimed that she had no idea that Rod was planning to kill her parents. I remember telling him flat out, don't even go near my parents. Why would you tell him not even to go near your parents? Because he asked me not too long ago if I wanted my parents dead or alive, and I said straight out I wanted them alive. When did he ask you this? On Monday, Monday after school. So on Monday after school, he talked to you about killing your parents? Yes, and I said no. I said I wanted him to leave them alone. During Rod's questioning, he said he felt like he was in a dream and he could wake up at any moment. Police wondered if he was high on drugs. After the questioning went on, Rod eventually confessed to the murders, hoping that police would let the rest of his friends free. But that wasn't going to happen. One by one, they interrogated each of them to get a complete picture of what happened at the Wendorf's house. Dana and Charity admitted to knowing about the plan to kill Heather's parents. Scott also admitted that he knew and told them that the initial plan was for him to kill the mother. But when the moment finally came, he couldn't do it. By the end of the interrogations, they charged Rod with armed robbery, armed burglary, and two counts of first-degree murder. Local media swarmed around him, and his story of being a vampire quickly became a spectacle for the entire nation. The case had disgusted everyone especially his religious neighbors back home in Murray, Kentucky. Once the news began reporting on the blood drinking, the drugs, and the murders, everyone across the U.S. were disgusted, but also intrigued by the vampire cult. And it didn't take long before people began suggesting that the possibility of a death sentence for Rod would be a real thing, even though he was just a teenager. Rod's trial began in early 1998, and it was actually at trial that Rod actually met his father again. He was only in court for one day and he didn't speak to Rod at all. While on the stand, Rick would only mention Rod as the child and he would never use his son's name. Later that day, Rod went back to his cell and cried. And some say this was one of the only times Rod had ever been seen crying. His trial continued and he initially pleaded not guilty. But as the evidence stacked against him, his lawyers had to change strategy. Because on February 12th, 1998, Rod pleaded guilty, hoping that he wouldn't get the death penalty. After all, he was only 16 at the time of his crimes, so there was a lot of controversy surrounding the death penalty sentence for a juvenile. His attorneys also argued that Rod was insane. He had been previously diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder and Asperger's, so they tried to use that to their advantage. Experts at the University of Florida also testified that Rod sometimes saw spiritual things, like angels and demons but in the end, it wasn't enough. Rod was convicted of the murders, and the judge sentenced him to death. It is hereby ordered in a judge, Roderick Justin Farrell, for the murder of Richard Wendorf. You are hereby sentenced to death. It is further ordered in a judge, Roderick Justin Farrell, for the murder of Naomi McQueen. You are hereby sentenced to death. Scott Anderson was convicted as a principal in the first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Even though he didn't physically commit the murders, he was present when they happened, which was enough to convict him in Florida. He also pleaded guilty to avoid the death penalty. As for Charity, she was convicted of two counts of third-degree murder, robbery with a deadly weapon, and armed burglary. She was sentenced to ten and a half years in state prison. 
Dana was convicted of the same charges, but she was given a seven and a half year prison sentence. Meanwhile, Rod's mother, Sandra Gibson, was convicted of a separate crime. She had tried to have sex with one of Rod's friends who was only 14 years old during a vampire ceremony. She ended up pleading guilty. As for Heather Windorf, she was never charged with a crime and was let free. The state attorneys decided not to prosecute her, but Sheriff George Knapp was disappointed in their decision. He thought that she was the motivation behind the murders. Scott also believed that she was the mastermind behind the entire operation, especially when she and Rod went out to the cemetery talking for hours before going back to her parents' house on the night of the murders. Still, a grand jury believed she was never a part of the murder plot and she was never convicted of a crime. After the convictions, the few members of the cult left continued to practice vampirism in Murray, Kentucky. And as Rod sat in prison, he still considered himself a vampire. Most of the vampire cultists had left Murray, Kentucky, but Jaden stuck around, recruiting new vampires for years after Rod's conviction. The vampire cult continued to be seen as pure evil by many of the locals, and even Jaden's mother condemned it. But Jaden argued that they were just misunderstood. He thought that the community of Murray feared the vampire cult because they didn't understand them. They knew that the cult was involved in drinking of each other's blood and self-mutilation. But Jaden argued that cutting yourself is the same as smoking a cigarette because you're just taking pleasure from damaging your body. He said it relieves stress and calms your nerves in the same way. Many of the members wore dozens of scars across their arms like badges of honor. And regardless of everyone else's opinions of their practices, Jaden and his friends kept the vampire cult going for years. Many of them didn't have any direction in life after high school, so they spent their time hanging out in basements and inviting local teenagers to join them. They went back to role-playing dark fantasies and drinking each other's blood in the shadows. And they still thought about their old friend Rod from time to time, but most of them had disowned him. For Rod's first two years in prison, he held the record as the youngest inmate on death row. Rod admitted that he always fantasized about going to the electric chair since he was nine years old. But in November of 2000, the Florida Supreme Court reduced his sentence to life in prison. Farrell was 16 when the killings took place, but was sentenced to death. He was spared from execution by a state Supreme Court ruling against condemning juveniles. And the nation's high court has ruled life without parole for juveniles is cruel and unusual punishment. The state of Florida doesn't often grant parole, so he was never given the option. As for the others, Charity was released in March 2006 and Dana was released in October 2011. Heather went on to live with her attorney's family and soon disappeared from the spotlight. She no longer speaks to her sister Jennifer, and she was last seen selling her artwork in a small gallery in 2007. On December 3rd, 2018, Scott Anderson was able to get a resentencing hearing, and his sentence was reduced from life to 40 years, and he'll actually be released in 2031 at the age of 51. As for Rod, though, he is still serving life without parole. But recently, the Supreme Court decided that life without parole is unconstitutional for minors. Plus, in 2020, the Florida State Supreme Court said that all juveniles who have been sentenced to life without parole must be resentenced. Since he committed the murders when he was 16, there's a possibility that Rod might have his sentence commuted. If that happens, he says he has a girlfriend, a house, and a job waiting for him if he does ever get out of prison. He believes everyone deserves a second chance, but many hope he stays behind bars the rest of his life for what he has done. Today, Rod Farrell's crime still sent a shockwave through the people of Murray, Kentucky. Even though the murders didn't take place there, the religious people of the Bible Belt struggled with their reputation and their own faith. Rod had left a permanent mark on the small religious town. They've had trouble understanding how someone so disturbed and vile could have come from a place so dominated by the Christian faith. But many don't believe Rod's actions had anything to do with God or the vampire cult. Like Jaden said all those years ago, no one can control Rod. He looked for any reason to hurt animals and kill people. Neither God nor his vampiric oath were going to stop him from doing that. His early childhood of living with an unstable mother, his lack of a father, his molestation, his social crew, and his thirst for blood and violence all led him down the path of darkness. While his charisma and his gloomy charm attracted other young teens to follow him down that path, many of them are still paying for it to this day, and possibly for the rest of their lives. Wow. 
I think it was definitely about more than just vampires for yeah. Rod. I think it got to a point where he just straight up wanted to be evil. He liked the power that it gave him. Absolutely. And the fear that it created from everybody else. I feel like he gave the, the vampire cult or just vampires in general a terrible rep. And the things that he did are just so fucked up. Not only killing human beings, but animals too. Animals as well. Yeah. And torturing them and um he's he's just such a fucked up person. I think he I think he really wanted to one up Jaden too. I think he yeah. felt like Jaden it was like it was really his rival. And I think he wanted to be even more powerful than Jaden. Mm-hmm. And the way to do that was to embrace the darkness within and truly become evil yeah. and commit murder, which killing humans is, you know, not a part of vampiric law, but he didn't care at that point. No. It, it wasn't about vampires for him anymore. It was just about being pure evil. Yep. And as a result, both of Heather's parents lost their lives in the most brutal way possible. Mm-hmm. And lots of innocent animals. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's sad because I think there's obviously a lot of factors from Rod's childhood. And when you watch those interviews of him in prison, I think you really get a sense of just how dark his his head is. Mm-hmm. I mean, just his mindset is just so messed up. And, you know, all the things he experienced growing up. And obviously when you start, doing things like that to animals it's only going to twist you even more in the wrong direction and i think he just got to a point where he literally didn't give a shit he just didn't didn't care he didn't care what happened to him i mean he's literally looking forward to the electric chair he's looking forward to experiencing what death is like through the electric chair and that's just how dark this this individual is at this point and it's it's sad i mean it's sad all the way around at 16 years old to commit murder and and throw your entire life away is just it's i don't even i don't even know what words there there is yeah, to describe same. that i mean it's rough being a teenager for sure and i mean it's especially in circumstances like that and i understand being in a, a town where you know everybody's religious and everybody's judgmental and everybody's kind of looking at you funny because you decide you want to live a different lifestyle i mean i saw that firsthand i mean joel and i grew up in a small town and there was definitely yeah. definitely people there that were gothic or you know, wore black and things like that. And they definitely, I mean, they got bullied, they got Mm. picked on and just, you know, called all kinds of names because they're different. And I think it's just sad that kids and teenagers especially just aren't more accepting of each other and just realizing that it's okay to be different and be into different things. And like, just because it looks weird to you and and maybe, you know, you go to church and your pastor saying that that's like, you know, those people are evil or embodying evil doesn't mean that the people are evil. No. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like the they're Jane's vampire cults kind of like and I don't want to compare it to cosplay because it's cosplay is totally different. And, mm-hmm. you know, but just in the sense of wanting to be something else in order to escape your situation or to just really truly enjoy your interests and passions to the fullest extent right Mm -hmm. it's like sort of that fantasy that exists in 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 all things i mean there's so many things that i sort of took upon myself and you know wanted to be a part of or really got into medieval and lord of the rings and all these different things and really that really became like a part of me in a Mm -hmm. way well it became a part of us yeah we we got matching lord of the rings brothers tattoos if we do you guys we do we do. We got the inscription of the one ring <laughs> yeah. on us. We uh, grew up on that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the same kind of thing. And, and other, other people find other things to sort of bring themselves together and create that family atmosphere, especially if you don't have a family at right. home and you don't have a, a stable place to live and it's really rough and, or you have abusive parents. Like I totally get this, this, you know, feeling of I need to belong somewhere. So if it's not with my family, then I'm going to go find it elsewhere. And that's where people rally around common interests and yeah. form these groups. And, you know, you could call it a cult or you could call it just a friend group. I mean, it seems like as far as Jaden's group goes, and I mean, I don't necessarily agree with drinking human blood uh, from no. each other or cutting yourself or anything Hell like that, no. but it's like they did that to feel a part of each other and feel like a family and, you know, obviously there's a, a lot of things that can go wrong there. And when you mix in drugs and everything else, I mean, it's, 
your your mind state can definitely go to a dark mm-hmm. place and 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 i think that's what happened with rod is it just oh, went yeah. to the he lost sight of reality and yeah. yeah there's just no excuses for rod's actions and the no. things that he's done other than he's pure evil yeah you know i mean i i don't know if there's a way to fix somebody like that and and i don't think that he's going to get I would be shocked if his sentence gets commuted in Florida, but mm, that'd be um, so I mean, fucked. Death yeah. penalty. I mean, you could debate. I'd like to know your your thoughts on yeah. that in the comments of whether or not you think Rod deserves death for what he did or not. But I think at the very least, he deserves to probably spend the rest of his life in prison because mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And he, even through his interviews and stuff, it seems like he really hasn't changed much, and he's just no. kind of living out that that purely evil dark fantasy of his of just being the the worst possible human you can and yeah that's the experience he wants so you definitely don't want somebody like that out on the out on the streets again and i'd hope they would at least keep him in solitary confinement so he doesn't have an influence on anybody because a lot of people you know even in his cult looked up to him and yeah I, i think they're all just as guilty too because they probably egged him on they egged each other on like yeah. who can do something more darker and you know just trying to impress each other yeah so. yeah i mean i think the the sentences for the others in rod's group were definitely needed i think mm-hmm. they needed to realize how serious things got and and obviously rod took it to the next level but two people lost their lives mm-hmm. for literally no reason yeah because rod felt like they needed to die so yeah it's just it's one of those it's one of those things where you know you can easily fall down the wrong path and mm-hmm. and if you don't watch yourself and you know make sure it doesn't go to that next level then it can it can get really scary really quick so I want to know what your thoughts are on this this case, though. Do you think that Rod deserves the death penalty? Does he deserve to die by electric chair for his crimes? Or should he just stay in prison for the rest of his life? Or what do you think about him his sentence being commuted because he was a minor when he committed the murders? I want to know your thoughts below. But that's where we'll wrap up Lights Out today. Again, make sure you're following and subscribe to us on YouTube and Spotify. We greatly appreciate it. And as always... Lights out, everybody.